Professor Stephen Reicher is a Wardlaw Professor of Psychology at St Andrews University. Um, he's currently a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the British Academy and numerous other academies and learned societies. Um, he's probably best known to an awful lot of people in the general public now. His activity on um, independent sage uh, and, yeah, and uh, lots of interviews on TV and radio in relation to COVID and COVID uh, policies uh, by, the, by the government, the UK government and Scottish government, whom he, whom he advises. So anyway, basically he's an expert, which, you know, unlike Michael Gove, uh, we do respect. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're not afraid to mention it. No, aside from work in uh, research uh, and teaching and uh, writing, uh, numerous books to his name. In fact, she's uh, regretting not having brought any tonight where you could have uh, signed them for you. Um, so in addition to that, um, we're, um, it's very exciting um, that he is um, drawing attention to the role of psychology in social issues, societal issues, big issues, important issues. And so I think, I think his work has really been important in that um, psychological expertise uh, can be very, uh, you know, can be very useful when addressing these, these big issues. Um, so I think I've probably said enough now. And um, so Professor Stephen Michael, thank you very much. Uh, there you go. <laughs> it really is. I mean, genuinely. Um, uh, first of all, it's so nice to see people uh, you know, face to face after all this time, and it's so nice to, to to meet you and meet this group because, I mean, in many ways, yes, for EU sums up. Uh, what I believe I, is uh, uh, you know, typical, basically, uh, Middle European. My parents came uh, from Poland, they came from Germany, uh, arrived in 1943 uh, from Palestine under Mahdi. Uh, and he became a pilot. He was a pilot in the Second World War. He flew patrols over the North Sea. He was billeted in the Palais de Danse. It doesn't get much more romantic than that, does it? And, um, and, and so my brother, uh, who lives in London, uh, wants to be by, by claiming German, German nationality. Um, personally, I'm European by being Scottish. Um, <laughs> You should also say it's cheaper because he has to pay. Please, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the core of this group is one that is very close to my heart. Secondly, um, the point uh, about psychology in the public domain is equally close to my heart. Uh, in the first independence referendum, at one point, I was phoned who said to me, can, can you speak to us about how the is causing conflict in families, uh, husbands and wives disagree. And, you know, it was that, and finally, we got the news, the cats, whatever. It was the like, after the real stuff, here's the light-hearted psychology. Um, and I lost it, and I started ranting and saying, it really annoys me. You only go to psychologists when you want something which you think is trivial. And you ignore the fact that at the core of the independence debate are psychological issues, and you should be talking about those core issues. And I spoke about two, and I deliberated. Uh, and I'll start off by telling you about the talk you're not going to get. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, but you didn't get. And that is, you know, what the independence debate is all about is decision making under uncertainty. Know what the outcome of independence is going to be. We can guess and extrapolate, but we can't know. So we're making decisions. We don't know what the consequences of those decisions is going to be. And there's a whole literature in psychology 
best known theory is something called prospect theory. Um, there are lots of teachers of psychology in here, so they all know what it is. Uh, but there might be one or two of you who are, so I'll uh, describe it's very well known theory by uh, very well um, and it's about the fact that on the whole we are loss averse we don't like losing basically uh, if we lose we're marks so the way in which you frame things when there's uncertainty is critical if you say to people will you take a risk to get a possible game so could be wonderful if we're independent. There are a number of problems, of course. We don't quite know what's going to happen with the uh, currency. We can't be sure. But we think it's worth taking a risk to get this game. People on the whole won't take that risk. But if you ask people to take a risk to avoid a certain loss, they're much more likely to do it. So if you say to people, look, if we do nothing, we're going to lose the NHS under these toils. If we do nothing, we're going to unequal society. Isn't it worth a risk? Right, and incidentally, it might be better. And actually, from the first, the second debate, the Yes campaign did rather change uh, that possible gain framing to the avoiding a loss. And it had something to do with the way in which um, you know, support increased. So, psychological research and psychological knowledge about us, I think, is really powerful and really valuable and at the core of the policy debate. But I'm not going to get back to that. I'm going to talk about the other thing, the thing that in many ways is most obvious about the psychology, which is we are talking about nations and national identity and the understandings and the feelings that are associated with national identity. And if you, unless you understand something about not only the politics of national identity and the sociology of national identity, but the psychology of national you won't really understand what the debate is all about. So I want to start off by saying something about national identity. This question of the dark side, the so-called dark side. I've been studying uh, identity for many, many years. I, I grew up as a psychologist in Bristol when one of the most uh, uh, influential theories of groups and group behavior, social identity theory, was developed by uh, Henri Tarstow another uh, uh, exile, uh, Jewish exile from Poland, uh, and John Turner. And their argument was, when you look at the issue of identity, we talk about identity all the time, we can't get away from it. You find it in everything from learned treatises to, uh, you know, to Hello Magazine, and like, identity is everywhere. And often when we think about, about identity, we think of it as a single thing, it's, it's me. It's my identity, it's what makes me unique. But if I was to ask anybody, if I was to ask any of you, who are you? You would tell me something about yourself as an individual. You'd say, I'm quite friendly, I'm quite shy. Uh, I've got hair, or I haven't got any. you tell me something about yourself and what makes you distinctive. But you would also tell me something about the groups you belong to. You would tell me, I'm a Scottish. Member of the SNP, you might tell me I'm a socialist, you might tell me I'm a hipster, oh, I'm a feminist. You tell me all sorts of things about yourself as a group member. They wouldn't be secondary, they wouldn't be less important in many ways. Actually, identities can be more important than our, our individual identities. You look at Ukraine today, and people are prepared to die to lose their individual personal, physical being for the group. As uh, I'm sure you all watched Eurovision on Saturday and see Ukraine win, one of the Ukrainian group of Bosnia because it chose to fight for Ukraine and put his life at risk. Social identities are absolutely critical to who we are. And when we behave in terms of a social identity, 
When we behave in a group, when we behave in a mass, the traditional psychology tells us we lose our individual identity, we become a mob. We hear a lot of that, don't you? The nationalist mob or a crowd of, of, of people supporting things is often seen to be a mindless mob as if they've lost their identity, they've lost uh, constraint, they've lost their morals. Actually, what happens when we come together is we shift. We shift A to we. We shift from thinking of ourselves in terms of our individual to our collective values, to our collective uh, norms. We don't lose for our behavior the basis shifts. What becomes important is not I, the being of the group is more important than my individual fate to the extent that we can die for the group if it affirms the group identity. So groups are incredibly important to us. And the meaning of groups is incredibly important to us. How we behave. Now, what then about national? See, I think people often fundamentally misunderstand national identity and what it's all about. They think it's about content. All the time when you talk about, well, whether it's Scottishness or Englishness or Britishness, or Germanness or whatever it is, people say, oh, what does it mean? What does it mean to be English? And there are uh, many famous essays, you know, occasionally it's old ladies cycling to tea. Um, uh, and so then I'll ask, what does it mean to be swapped? As if there's a single answer to it. But actually, I think it's much more to think of national identity as a container. Not a content, it's the container. It's something that brings us together that members of a nation, as members of a nation, as Scots, something in common. We do have common concern and common thought. We should act together, because how else could we be Scots? Unless we do have something in common. And so there is the assumption that we will act together. But for precisely that reason, those who want us to act in particular ways will argue Scottish. The content of Scottishness is not a given, it's because if you win that argument, you don't just say how I should behave, you explain how all of us will behave. And so when it comes to national identity, if you find arguments over national identity, people contesting it and trying to claim that their view, their politics represents who we really are. A number of years ago, a colleague, Nick Hopkins and I wrote a book called um, uh, Self and Nation. Um, and basically looked at the arguments of the Scottishness in the 1992. Um, it interviewed all sorts of interesting people Burn, if you remember him, um, the difficulty with interviewing him is that so many whiskeys were consumed, it had no effect on him. But, <laughs> but anyway, and what we found interestingly, and I think this is quite important, is we've expected to find that the SNP were more likely national identity than other groups. That makes sense, doesn't it? But actually what we found is that everybody claimed national identity. Nearly everybody would, but this is a very painful bit of the talk because I give myself bruises. Mm -hmm. but, but the speaker would call and say, I yield to nobody in my Scottishness, please. And then if they were Labour, they would say, what does it mean to be Scottish? Well, to be Scottish, communal and corporate. It means to look after. That's fine with that cold climate. We need to come together and look after each other. So the welfareism of labor represents what it means to be sorted. And then the Tory would come on, beat their chest, yield to nobody in their Scottishness, but then say, what does it mean? Scottish, they would say, means to be entrepreneurial, means to be and go out into the world and 
uh, make your fortune. And so Tory policies represent the true Scot. And what is more, they would say, because of our cold and brutal weather, we need to be independent and hardy. And, uh, and uh, we need to be able to uh, uh, look after ourselves. Scottish. And then, you know, so please be equally Scottishness. And then say, what does it mean to be Scottish? And I remember one particular speech. Actually, it was a brilliant speech by, uh, by Jim Sillers, um, who was a brilliant speaker, uh, if you remember. And he talked about crossing swords, bank burn fighting for independence and just a bannock burn, put your cross in peace. So, so we saw different notions of what to be Scottish, different arguments to be uh, Scottish. So I think we need to be clear and explicit about that. That's not a bad thing. It means that identity is something not that is handed down to us, we're prisoners of identity. Identity is a conversation about what sort of society do we want. As a nation, we live together in this uh, uh, part, desire. How do we want to see ourselves? Well, what do we want to see us? Uh, uh, what do we want to be us? What sort of society do we want to live in? Now, I've given you uh, some examples there, if you like, anecdotally, examples of different politics, but positive research, if you do uh, analyses of uh, beliefs, you find the same thing. So, for instance, there is no correlation between strength of identification, how much you feel Scottish, and whether you believe in independence. Right. Historically, there were forms of unionist nationalism. By Michael Morton on unionist nationalism. Really interesting. He says, look, at that people felt ferociously Scottish, but felt they were better able to Scotland's interests as part of the UK. What you find is the thing that leads. It's not a sense of strong Scottishness, it's that we cannot tell us, we cannot express our identity in the larger there's an incompatibility between what we believe and what they, the English, power to stymie us being ourselves. So again, it comes down to me, it is critical, it's that sense of we cannot be us. As which is why, of course, you find many people who believe in independence and believe in the EU, because they say, on the one hand, we can't be ourselves in Britain, but secondly, we can't be ourselves, we can't thrive outside Europe. There's no contradiction. So strength of identification, again, it's not, do you feel Scottish? It's, what does Scottishness mean? So, to the issue of the dark side, you also find identification does not determine other types of attitude. People on the whole think self-evidently, they think it's self-evident, that the more you identify with the nation, the more you feel Scottish, the more you will be distant from other nations, the more there will be xenophobic, you'll be xenophobic, the more that you will be um, anti-immigrant. But there is no simple relationship between strength of identification, national identity, and immigrants. In some countries, you find that more that people identify keep immigrants out. In other countries, you find the more you identify, the more you want to. It comes down to the way in which you understand who we are. Now, it's probably too simplistic, but people do draw a distinction between what they call nationalism and ethnic nationalism. Actually, there are many variants, but it, bear with me. I'm sure many people would want to attack that simplistic uh, division, but it's not a bad division to start off with. And civic nationalism is yeah. the notion that you are a member of the nation if you live and are committed to the nation. 
where you come from, it's where you're going to. It's not your past, it's not your destiny, it's your choice. And ethnic nationalism, it's saying um, you are Scottish because your parents were born in Scotland, in Scotland, uh, and so on. And therefore, it is where you came from. It's your destiny. You have no choice over it. And the problem with it, of course, is that it means that anybody who is an incomer can be Scottish. And since certain ethnic groups are more recent incomers, it necessarily means, you say, uh, you know, that the Pakistani or Indian or Chinese Jewish uh, population. Again, these are our ideal types, because quite frankly, if you think about it logically, nobody could be Scottish if you took a pure ethnic view. But your parents back to about third, well, to time immemorial, or else uh, if they were, then you know, cascade down, you would be Scottish. Um, when we were doing our research, that some people would apply this logic and say, oh, well, Salmon isn't really Scottish. His, I think, his, I think his, uh, his ancestors came here in the 18th century. Um, uh, so you can not take the argument too far. But the point is that on the whole, what you find is that when people have of nation birth, then the more you identify with nation, the more pro you want people to be committed to the nation. And the more that you believe nationhood, then if you identify with you are more exclusive uh, and don't want immigrants to come in. So it's not identification, it's the meaning of identification. But who are we? It's that conversation of what do we believe in? Then we then turn more exclusive to the issue of the dark side. And the first point I want to make, of course there is a dark side to nationalism. Of course there are dark. Years ago I did some research looking at the rescue of Jewish populations. There's one country in particular person was deported to the death camps, although it was part of the Axis forces, it was basically controlled by Germany. Germans tried twice to deport the Jews to Auschwitz. They failed because of a counter-mobilization. That country is Bulgaria. Actually, it's the lands of old Bulgaria. But still, in Bulgaria, twice there were mobilizations. And I, I looked at how people mobilized. And what was fascinating is they didn't mobilize. They didn't use the word Jew. They talked about it. It wasn't a way, a, a matter of defending them. They were attacking them. They were attacking us because Jews were Bulgarian. They have the same hearers as us. They sing the same folk songs as us. Others, like we do, they would say. It was that Jewish people were part of the nation. They were part of the group, right? And therefore, deporting them was... A the interesting thing is, contrast that with Nazi Germany. There's a fake book which Goebbels had sent out to every single city of National Socialism, sent out in 1934. And it says, what is the first commandment of National Socialism? It is love thy ethnic comrade as thyself. Mm -hmm. Now, at one level, of course, that's the same as Bulgaria. Love, love yourself. They are part of you. They're part of yourself. The, those boundaries are Jewish people part of us or and of course in Nazi Germany Jewish people were seen as they were seen as a threat to the nation they were seen as a threat to its survival and we all know what the consequences were so of course nobody can deny that and equally 
Okay, Putin's well, in Ukraine is based on toxic nationalism. A romantic, great Russian nationalist. He has this notion of this uh, as this great, pure, spiritual country. And the West from all sides who are taking away its rightful lands of the it's in the right to go in and wreak uh, appalling carnage upon the people of Ukraine. The toxic nationalism is a reality. Nobody can deny it. But the question is this: the question is this: is it an element of all nationalism? Is there a danger that whatever we say to be nice and cozy? The germ is there in naive, and we might be encouraging calling consequences. You might not want them, but we can't. Them. Or is it that those elements, all nationalisms, but nonetheless, we need to recognize them when they come about so that we can challenge them? The Scottish identity that we is more positive. So, what are the elements which lead to that toxicity? What are they so that we can identify them and we can challenge them? And I've already kind of talked about both of them in a way, but now let me be more explicit. The first question, it seems to me, is us. Defining who we are, what is the intra group dimension. The and the question of who are we? Do we in Scotland have that civic view, an, an inclusive view, or do we have an ex which is now? I think it's really important not to oversimplify. Important to be able to recognize good things ignoring, denying the problems, the challenges, the bad things. But Scotland, over the last 30 years, has pioneered a, a more inclusive system. I do remember a number of years ago, um, um, and, uh, and we had the hustings. And I have to say, unfortunately, the SMP, uh, a society student, got up and said, the NP, you're just the SNP. And he became passionate. And he said, look, he said, he said, the one thing I can tell you is I was born in England and I lived in England. But now I'm in Scotland, I'm committed to Scotland, and I'm accepted as a new Scot. And my wife is similar, and my agent is similar. But I am accepted as a new Scot. That's not by everybody, but by and large, I think there is that acceptance. And there's that famous speech, and I know uh, Alex Salmond is rather tarnished in, in recent times, but it, nonetheless, he was, let's not forget, a, a brilliant. There's a lovely um, speech he once gave where he said, I want to hear the cause of Scotland. In Chinese accent, an Indian accent, a Pakistani accent. And I think the SNP deserve credit, but I think Scotland more generally deserves credit for that. At the same time, there are ambivalences. So at the same time, in the same year um, that uh, Salmon was giving this wonderful speech, there was, if you remember, the homecoming. 
And the homecoming was partly a, a, a tourist thing. It was partly, and I understand that, but it was rooted around the notion that, you know, you are Scottish, even if you left Scotland God knows how many generations ago and for, have forgotten you're Scottish and didn't even realise you're Scottish, but ethnically you're one of us, so we can draw you back and, um, and take your dollars from you. But nonetheless, the question is, how does that play? What does that say you know, to uh, a Pakistani family who haven't been here for very long, being told actually what it really is to be Scottish is to have these ethnic roots? So there are tensions, there are differences. And I think at the same time as celebrating what's good, we need to see and understand the dangers that are there once we begin to ethnicalize identity. Because these, these things, they're two ideal types, the ethnic and the civic. There are elements, and I think there are dangers. And I think the important thing, what I'm trying to argue, is we need to be aware of those dangers. Claiming absolute purity is always a danger because nobody is absolutely pure. Everyone makes mistakes. But let me just conclude this bit of the speech by an illustration of why it matters. That might seem trivial, but I think it adds up. Because being part of a nation, isn't just formally belonging. It's not just being said, yeah, you're Scottish. But it's a sense that in the small ways, you're treated in exactly the same way. But people aren't surprised that if you're elected as a representative, people aren't surprised to see you um, in a kilt or whatever it might be. It's the small things, the small interactions often which tell you whether you belong or not. The trivia add up to give you a sense of, am I recognized as Scottish, or do I have to think people not, might not recognize me as Scottish? So we did an experiment. Uh, with some colleagues. It's very simple experiment. The young woman of Chinese origin, wearing a Scotland shirt. Scotland. So by her face, ethnically, she's not Scottish. By her shirt, civically, she is Scottish. She's walking around along with a file of files and some pencils on top. And she stumbles and they fall to the ground. And do other people help her? Those small acts of civility, those small everyday acts of civility, which tell you what you belong or not. But what we find is, in the experiment, she's walking past a lecture room where people are coming out and they've either had, just had, you know, a talk on Scottishness, which is about Scottishness being civic or about it being ethnic. And when they're talking about Scottishness being ethnic, she's not helping. People walk by, they don't help pick up the pencils. And when the talk is about Scottishness being civic, she is helping. <laughs> and to me, what's nice about this as a demonstration and illustration is it shows us if this is true even in the trivial, that tells us something about the texture of everyday life. Because the texture of everyday life isn't big political things. It's not big formal debates about them. It's precisely those small things. So as I say, how we talk about Scottishness and who we include is critical. Now the second dimension, and I'm aware that I'm going on a bit long, so I'll, I'll finish in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, the second dimension is not how we see ourselves, but how we see our relations to others. Not the intra-group, not the inside group, but the inter-group. And there is a particular configuration of intergroup beliefs, which you find time and time again, which is toxic. It's that notion of ourselves as a special people who've been brought low by others. We've been brought low by others who have uh, stopped us, interfered with us, uh, acted against us. Actually, there's something very similar about Donald Trump and about Vladimir Putin. Because if Donald Trump is make America great again, Vladimir Putin is make Russia great again. And it starts from the notion of a special 
exceptional people of exceptionalism, city on a hill, the great Mother Russia, which has been brought low by enemies. Trump's terms, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the globalists, it's the Mexicans, it's the Chinese, aided and abetted by enemies within, by traitors, that has brought us low. And so we have to uh, fight back and, and, and fight against those enemies in order to rediscover our true selves. It's sort of like forward to the past. Let's, let, let's rediscover our greatness. And Putin is saying exactly the same thing. Great Mother Russia, which has defended spiritual values, attacked by the decadent West with its materialist ways, we are going to reassert ourselves against that grievance nationalism. That sense of, you know, the problem lies in others. Not in ourselves, if we have weaknesses, it's not what we've done wrong, it's not our internal problems, we blame it on somebody else. Now again, I think in the Scottish sense, there is an argument that the reason why we want independence is not because we have enemies, not because the English have done terrible things to us, but because simply we have different values and different priorities. We want to decide things for ourselves. It's not a grievance nationalism. In fact, if anything, it's a nationalism which wants to get away from uh, grievance because so that people are forced to confront them, uh, that, that if things go well or go badly, it's up to them, not up to others. So I think on the whole, again, I think the, the balance sheet is rather good, but we can't deny the fact that there is some of that grievance nationalism, or sometimes called blood and soil nationalism, around. It wasn't a coincidence, for instance, that uh, you know, the referendum was on the anniversary of Bannock. And it's not, we know that there are narratives around, the problem lies in the English. They brought us low. We've got to fight them to get, uh, to get our independence. So again, the point I'm trying to make is not to say either we're awful or we're perfect but to understand the elements which make our nationalism more inclusive, more generous, more self-critical to improve ourselves rather than other critical in order to attack others. And to be able to identify when those elements come around so that we can challenge them. And so in this conversation we have about who are we and what can we be, we make sure we don't fall into those traps which lead to exclusion, which lead to uh, xenophobia, which lead to hostility. So with that in mind, let me go back to my original question. The dark side of nationalism, undoubtedly there, is it a fatal flaw or is it a convenient myth? Well, I would argue that in a sense, it's a bit of both. There clearly are elements, configurations of nationalist ideology which are dangerous and which are harmful and which are a million miles away. And a way to make sure that we don't fall into those traps is to be aware of those traps and not to say, oh, we're different, we couldn't be like that. At the same time, the notion that inevitably, inevitably nationalism is going to be exclusive or xenophobic, I think is just plain wrong. It needn't be. The choice is actually not in our nature. It's not in an inbred psychology. It's actually in the content of our understandings of and conversations. It's out of choice. It's up to us. And I think not only can we choose an independent Scotland, but we can also choose an independent Scotland to be proud of, which is inclusive, which is tolerant, and which does have positive relations with other countries. So I'll stop at that. Point. Thank you very much. That was brilliant and very, very thought provoking for everybody, I'm sure. Um, so I'm going to chair the questions now. Um, we can start in the room and then there'll be go online. So, yeah. Uh, if you tell, 
Uh, thank you so much. That was uh, very thought provoking, as you said, Leslie. Uh, and I, one of the things you talk about national identity uh, is, is what's been on my mind all through the campaign. And uh, when we're out on the street, uh, if it's about identity, is it more important to address the emotional content or is it the, the logic, rational uh, way that, that's a better for persuading people? See, I I've always found the distinction between reason and emotion a deeply problematic one, as if, you know, reason is good and emotion is bad. You also find, actually, um, you know, for many years I studied crowd behavior, and the classic idea is that um, individuals are rational and crowds are emotional and therefore bad, and uh, these things are also gendered. You know, men are always the good thing. Men are rational and women are emotional. I, I think that if you start from looking at psychology, not in terms of what we think, but what we do, in terms of practice, in terms of action, then to act, you need two things. Right? You need an understanding of what the world is like and how to achieve particular ends, but you also need a sense of what is important, okay? what's worth doing. You can't act without having reason and emotion. And therefore, I, I, to, to my mind, this, this sort of this game, this zero sum game saying which one is good, one is bad, and one, one uh, you know, the less of the other. I, to me, you know, when we talk about these things, I, I, it, it's a matter of being clear with people about precisely this conversation. We need a discussion about who we are and who we want to be because I think that's empowering. It hands back to people the fact that, you know, it's not that we are uh, bound to act in particular ways because of some uh, pre-given notion. It's, it's a much more empowering notion of, of, of we need to sit down and we need to have a conversation together about who we are uh, and what we are. Now, of course, I think when you have people who have, you know, identities that are very important to them, and our identities are important to us because they do position us in the world. They tell us uh, what, 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 what matters. Then to, um, you know, to attack an identity, people are going to be defensive unless you give them something else. I, I, to me, it's, it, it, it's pointing out um, the possibilities of who we can be. That's really important and really empowering and really positive. Thank you. Anything else? I was an SNP for a very long time before um, 2014. And <clears throat> I'm, I was conscious of this vaguely in the SNP itself before 2014, but I'm really conscious, I was conscious of it in the S movement and the SNP now, um, the post referendum SNP, if you like, which was is a lack of nationalism, the lack of a pride of nationalism. And, how, and we can talk about, and your talk obviously touched on many elements of what nationalism is. But the, a lot of the members, especially those who joined the SNP post-2014 and the members of the S movement more generally, they had a very strong idea, which I personally agree with, so it's not that I'm disagreeing with the idea, of what they wanted an independent Scotland to be, the elements, they, so they wanted to be left of centre, to be open and inclusive, and, you know, as I say, I, I, I have no struggle with any of that. But, the, so if I said to any of those people, say we could have an independent Scotland tomorrow, but I can see into the future, I'm going to have a horrific right-wing government in an independent Scotland. Would you still want an independent Scotland? A huge number of those people said no. So it, independence was a means to an end, a socialist end. And as a socialist, you know, as I say, I've not got a problem with the end. But to me, nationalism is not means to an end. It's, you know, it's much more complex, complex interweaving between, you know, the kind of society I want to live in. And so I'm still, I'm constantly thinking about this, even now, you know, what is this, there's an embarrassment to say, we want to live in Scotland, if we're not a guarantee that we'll have all these values, these radical values. I was at a talk last week, actually, by James Mitchell, who was talking about the history of radicalism in Scotland. So there's this idea that by being Scottish, we're absolutely more left-wing, we're more caring, we're more community-focused, that's a part of our DNA. And if we stop believing that by ourselves and say we'll be an independent country, but we might have a horrific independent country. There are awful independent countries in the world. 
you know, but no one, when Trump was the president of America, people didn't say, I don't feel American anymore. They say, we must get rid of Trump. We must get a new, we must get a new president. With, you know, we share one of our values. So I was just wondering if you could say anything about that. As I say, it feels like an embarrassment about nationalism within the Yes movement and within uh, the SAP, but you, we, we don't want to be yes. I mean, first of all, there is a really interesting history of histories of nationhood. Um, and actually, in England, um, there are a number of very well-known historians that we'll, everybody will know, uh, Eric Hobsbawm, uh, E.P. Thompson, uh, Rude, and so on, who were all part of the Communist Party Historians Group. Okay? And what they were trying to do was to construct a notion of Englishness going back to what Tyler and the peasant, uh, uh, you know, the peasants uprising and so on, which was around rights. And so constructing those narratives of who we are is part of that conversation. The same in Scotland. So yes, there is that, you know, that narrative of radicalism. Um, you know, people have tried to resurrect the insurrection of 1818, for instance. It's rather hard to do because not many people know about it. But you know, you can draw on, on, on Red Clyde side. And I remember um, when, when the, the referendum, referendum uh, campaign was launched, it was actually launched by Nicola Sturgeon in St Andrews, and she gave this wonderful talk in which she drew on Red Clyde side as part of that heritage. Now, people will argue about that, but nonetheless, it was about constructing a particular notion of what Scottishness is. But it leads, I think, to an issue, because for me, in the end, nationhood, and especially, especially independence, it's, it's fundamentally an issue of, of democracy. At what level do you decide and what's the best level to decide at? I like small nations. Um, I like small nations in part because you are nearer the seat at the international table, mm -hmm. but you also feel that you are involved, that, you are, uh, yeah, that your voice makes a difference. And when you are part of big nations and you don't feel that, that's the point when you give up on democracy and you go to populist leaders who say, oh, well, you can't do it for yourself, so I will magically you know, transform things uh, for you. So for me, you know, nationhood is an issue of involvement and democracy, and there are absolutely no guarantees. It's our choice in the end. Again, I come back to that point, that it, it is our choice. And to give a guarantee is actually to take choice away from us. Um, it also leads to, a, to an interesting question of, do you try and, if you like, create an unarguable notion of our history? We must be this, so we can't be anything else. Or do you accept the fact that this is an argument? I, I, there might be other arguments, but, 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 but democracy, this is, Habermas would argue this, democracy is about a robust public sphere in which we argue with each other. And we argue sometimes viciously with each other, but, and this is critical, we all accept that everybody is part of the community and has a right to be part of that conversation. And what I want to see, you know, in, in, in Scotland, and, and I hope in any nation, is a robust public sphere, a robust commons, a, a place where we do have that argument about who we are because the, the, the future is uncertain, but precisely because the future is uncertain, if you have that de democratic debate, then you cannot have certainty. And I think there's a real danger for that demand for uh, certainty, because in the end, I think it leads to autonomy. I think we have a question online um, from Bill Rogers. It says, does it follow directly from your argument that a leave voting nationalist, whether indie sport or not, is falling oh, yeah. victim to do dark? I can't hear it back. Oh, uh, sorry, I'll shout. Does it follow directly from your argument that a leave voting nationalist, whether indie sport or not, is falling victim to the darker side of their own brand of nationalism, whether Scottish or British? So let, let me tell you a story about this. Um, I think it was 2015. Um, for some reason, I was invited um, uh, to speak to the, to the end of the year review at the British Academy. So a number of us who was trying to say, you know, what's the big issue? What's the big issue? And I tell you, uh, you know, I, I'm not particularly uh, uh, a creature of the establishment, but this was the most establishment thing I've ever seen in my whole life. 
Okay. So the British Academy is just off the Mall. Um, it's Gladstone's old house. And we were in the music room with the string quartet in the corner, champagne and canopies, and you know, all the well-known BBC and Times and Guardian journalists were there. And my argument was that actually Brexit was a failure of liberal democracy. Okay? But we shouldn't blame them, we should blame ourselves. And the reason why we should blame ourselves is the fundamental dynamic of Brexit was people feeling excluded, people feeling that they weren't listened to, um, people feeling that they have no uh, choice over their lives, um, and that they wanted control of their lives, which is why slogans like take back control were so important. And they saw politics and the political class as ignoring them. So if you remember the day before the Brexit vote, um, the, uh, the Yes campaign lined up all the living prime ministers to say, let's stay in Europe. And there was a sense, this is a coup. We've got the whole spectrum. And they didn't understand that, no, what they had was the political class in its entirety coming together, reinforcing a sense of exclusion. And the problem is, and with Trump as well, the problem is that various people have been ignored, haven't been spoken for, right? And this in many ways was saying two fingers to a political class which ignored them. So I, I think rather than blaming individuals um, who are Brexiteers as all being this, that and the other, it's actually it's much more functional to be critical of ourselves, because of course I'm part of that liberal, um, you, know, um, you know, middle class, and I probably am, you know, I'm, I'm a professor at St. Anna's for God's sake, so I probably am at some level a member of the establishment, although that doesn't sit easily with my, with my self-image. So I do think we need to be self-critical. Um, and I think it's really dangerous to, uh, you know, to tell Brexiteers they're all, you know, they're all fools and racists and, and so on. I don't deny there is racism, right? But if you want to reinforce that division, if you want to reinforce the sense that we are out group, we are they and nobody's going to listen to it, you do it, uh, I think, by, by you know, characterizing the flaws are in themselves. One of the things, okay, one of the lessons I have learned from studying intergroup relations for actually now over 40 years is you rarely change anything by telling others that they are wrong. You change things by looking at how you're doing wrong, uh, things wrong and change the intergroup context in which uh, case you unblock things and they begin to move. <clears throat> Just on that point, I have a question. So, well, two questions actually. So the first one is um, that a lot of the people that I have come across who are very anti-Scottish independent and um, are very, they have their own group. And I don't like to say Ranger supporters, but a lot of, a lot of I mean, there's Ranger supporters that support independence, but within that, that sort of sphere, if you like. And so because their identity is so strong and within that group, how do you go about talking to people and you say, you know, you look at yourself. So if I came across somebody and, and I'm thinking of a, a particular very not nice incidents and I knew the person and they were very, you know, you're this and you're that and I was trying to talk rationally but um, how would you actually go about trying to look at yourself to talk to somebody out of that? I suppose, I mean one of the other areas that um, I work in is leadership. We've, uh, we've done a lot of work on leadership. Um, uh, if, I were, if I was filming you books, um, uh, we've just written a book on leadership. Uh, I wouldn't wish that on, on many people who are the wrong students. Okay. But one of the points that we make is the first aspect of leadership is to understand the group so you can represent them. Now, the ideologies of leadership are basically the great leaders who are different from the group. Actually, no, great leaders are people who understand and can represent the group. And so the first skill of leadership isn't talking, it's listening. A number of years ago, one of my colleagues, co-authors, Alex Haslam, um, uh, did a, a cheeky but very entertaining little study. He, he took um, a year group of students. And at the beginning of the year, he just asked people, who do you think, who, put up your hands if you think you're a good leader. 
do people put up their hands? And at the end of the year, he asked people, who do you think are good leaders in this group? And the people who put up their hands were virtually last. And the reason is that if you think you know it all, you're not going to listen. You're not going to understand the group and you're going to separate yourself from the group and you're not going to be a very good leader. So I think one of the things I would say is politics is about listening. And one of the first things I would do is before I went in and I told them that they were wrong, I would want to listen and understand their point of view. I think it's really important. Often we read others through the prism of our own beliefs and we misunderstand them. And you're never going to be able to argue with anybody if you don't understand where they're coming from. So I suppose, as I say, my, my answer would be before talking to them, I would listen to them and try and understand, okay, how do they see them? What are their concerns? How do they constitute uh, uh, the groups and so on. And then you begin to have a handle on, on, on how you can then uh, perhaps uh, address that and be persuasive. Sometimes it's quite difficult on a Saturday yeah. to stall. It's <laughs> just <laughs> like getting us uh, irritated. Um, so the other question, kind of along the same lines, is if, um, you know, we in this group, in this room, I'm sure we need to, we have a very civic, inclusive nationalism. But, you know, the, 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 um, the Scottish independence movement gets accused all the time, and Boris Johnson uses it all the time as, you know, as a, a you know, um, tarnish us with, a tarnish us with the dark side of nationalism. Mm -hmm. kind of. So how can if somebody say that, oh, you're a nationalist, you know, you're, you're bad kind of thing, what evidence can you use to say, actually, Scottish nationalism isn't dark, you know, it's all very well, but no, actually, we are really inclusive, and obviously, as a group, I think, there's, you know, yes, we you, we're mostly, a lot are not Scottish people, so we can say, you know, we are an inclusive group, but, you know, to people on the street, again, how would you address okay. that? So, I think there is some of the evidence I spoke about, you know, the evidence that in Scotland, the more people, uh, um, uh, identify and more people uh, support independence, the more pro-immigrant they are. Okay. So yeah. there's clear evidence. But let me use one other piece of evidence, which I think is really interesting. Because during COVID, one of the arguments I was making, and several were, were, were making, is that the thing that got us through COVID, very much thinking in terms of we rather than I, right? Thinking about what I do for the community rather than for myself. And there's a lot of empirical evidence, a lot of studies of, um, uh, of that, which show that, for instance, the more people uh, identified nationally, um, uh, the more they would hear to with measures, the more they identified with local communities, uh, and so on and so forth, right? The, the, the acting for the community, you know, wearing a mask because, okay, I might not need a mask, but I don't want to infect somebody who is vulnerable, that, you know, that was really important. And I, I think we've forgotten that. But anyway, the interesting thing was, how do you bring people together? Uh, and in Scotland, you could use Scottishness. If you remember the adverts, you could say, we are Scotland. We do, right? And I spoke to and uh, had, uh, did some work with some of the people doing it. And there was a very clear sense that you can use that. And it, it is inclusive, right? Most people would see that as speaking to them. That wasn't even contemplated in England, right? Because if you said, we are England, this is Englishness, there's a very clear sense of that's an ethnic identity and that would exclude people. So the very fact, you know, that in our culture, we take it for granted when it says we Scotland, that means, you know, whether you are, you know, with, whether you have an English accent, a Scottish accent, an Indian accent, Pakistani accent, you were Scotland. And that to me was really interesting because we it was taken for granted. It was obvious. It was obvious you could do it in Scotland. It was obvious you couldn't do it in England. So any other questions? We have a few questions. Could you say something about patriotism and nationalism? I, I hate the word patriotism. You get people to you're not patriotic or well, I am patriotic and that scares me more with nationalism, but I, I wonder what you think. Yeah. I mean, part, part of the problem is that people define these terms. So I think, I think it's, um, 
yeah, there's part, partly an issue of um, uh, um, of, of language, but there's some really nice research um, about different relations to the nation. Okay. And there is, there's national glorification. We are wonderful in every way, right? Um, we can do no wrong. Therefore, it's always my nation right or wrong because my nation by definition is right. Okay. And then there are other starters, including something which is called critical uh, 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 well, can be called critical patriotism, but that's an attitude, you know, I, I believe in my nation and, and I love my nation, but I know my nation, uh, you know, isn't perfect and therefore I serve my nation by pointing out its, its defects, right? And there's some really interesting research done in, certainly in Israel, um, and, 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 and we know in Israel, you know, that, that nationalism got really dangerous side effects. And what they found is that if you looked at people who identified strongly as Israeli, but who rejected glorification, you know, we are right, okay, then they would be critical of the mistreatment of Palestinians. The people who justified the, um, uh, the mistreatment of Palestinians were those who, um, who, who identified highly and glorified, right? So that, that uncritical attitude towards the nation as a to that critical attitude. And again, I think one thing that is terribly diagnostic of any group, but cer certainly of a nation, is if you are committed to do you um, show that by justifying everything your nation does, or do you show real love for your nation by pointing out its flaws um, so that we can be improved on? And again, I think that's culturally something quite difficult to do, but culturally something that's really important to do, because if we glorify, if it's my nation right or wrong, then we mistreat the just, uh, the, the mis uh, then we justify the mistreatment of others, and it becomes, it can be very toxic indeed. Yes, I think Hi, and then thank you so much for all that. Can I just first of all apologize that I've got a slight condition, so I sometimes don't slightly. So I missed a tiny bit of what you said, but um, can I ask what you were saying at the start about the prospect theory stuff? At yeah. um, this point, you very helpfully explained to us about how people will um, vote for change if it means avoiding a loss, but not so much for gain. Um, in my group, Yes, Tabar, we, we do what you said, but went out on the doorsteps um, um, do a little, little survey, really trying to listen to people this weekend. Uh, we had 50 well, doorstep conversations, and as you would expect, um, there were some are very pro yes, and some are very clearly no, and it's the ones in between. And we know, of course, about winning the independence campaign is all about how we reach the ones in between. But what we found mostly was that those who were in the kind of not sure category were really quite disconnected from the politics and the political debate. And um, so whatever arguments I think were about, I was just going to largely pass people over and so on. And I guess um, the question is, how do, we, how do we get them to vote yes next time? And we, 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 in some ways, perhaps we've got to try and scare them with us in the way that the Vote Leave campaign did. did. Yes. But I don't want to be quite the techniques for Vote Leave. On the other hand, um, so how do you react to that? Yeah. I mean, if that's all, vote leave, of course, did use the argument that we're losing all the time. Um, you know, it's costing us 350 million quid. They were saying take a risk uh, to avoid a certain loss. They did it rather, rather skillfully. So, okay. Oh, well, in that case, we've got the argument. You've already got a certain loss of being outside the EU. Take a risk to reverse that loss. Yeah. Well, there was, wasn't there, wasn't it the Bank of England today, which talked about 444 million pounds, you know, lost. Uh, you know, I mean, th these figures are so okay, but it, I mean, one of the you know, if you wanted to do uh, social influence 101, okay, the most basic factor is on the whole, we listen more to in group members than to out group members. The second thing is one of the tensions of leadership always is we always have a question in our mind, which is, is a leader one of us, right? So, you know, if you're in the Labour Party, you know, is a leader a late person? 
Or is it that they're all the same in a leadership class? They are all the same, that outgroup, uh, that leaders, if so fast, are part of an outgroup category. And one of the things that has happened in recent years, and the right is because we live in an anti-political age, precisely because people feel politicians aren't looking after their interests. Any politician is seen as out. They're all the same. The expenses scandal, that's what that was all about. It was saying they're all the same. They're all their stats in, in the truck. They're all out group. We don't listen to, to anyone. So it is perfectly true you pose things um, in terms of, you know, politician speaking to you. Um, then, then you're always going to get people who see politicians that who aren't, who aren't, who aren't going to be influenced at all. Then the question is, you know, how do you have those debates and those discussions from members of their own uh, communities or members of uh, communities they feel they belong to? So it's not that they are being communicated with by politicians, but those conv conversations are happening within other groups and, and, and people who are concerned with them. It, it's the debate we also had throughout COVID. You, for instance, go to particular communities um, and you tell them to take a vaccine, right? Well, those communities which are alienated from the political, those who believe that um, you know, authorities don't look after them, are not likely to listen. It's not they're stupid. It's not that they're selfish. It's that there's a history of distrust. One of the reasons, for instance, why the black population is far more less likely, uh, less likely to get vaccinated is because, I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a survey that came out showing that about over 60% of the black population feels the health services do not cater to them. So the issue is not of misunderstanding, an issue of trust in the sources of information, right? And that's absolutely critical, of course, in any communication at all. If, if you don't trust politicians, you're not going to listen to anybody. Um, as I say, you've then got to think, how can we engage and how can we go through communities and how can we work at that sort of level um, in order uh, to get people to listen to us? I think one quick, quite last quick question from the back. Uh, good evening, Professor. I'd just like to say thank you for a very interesting evening and to those of you who organised it. Thank you very much. I belong to an organisation here in called Edinburgh Women for Independence. And from 2013 till the moment, when we've had drop-in cafes, and even a fortnight ago when we had public stalls across Edinburgh, I have to admit, I cannot remember one occasion when we've ever been asked about nationalism or identity. Mm -hmm. What we are asked about constantly is cost of living, mm -hmm. that may be the phrase now, but it's always been around a betterment of society for women, children, and families future. That's what we're challenged on, and that's what we're asked about, which takes me to your point about democracy, because what we try to do is to ensure that those who do engage with us, and there are occasions, yes, when we will get unionists who will turn around and say, no, we're not going to vote for independence, but what we try to ensure is that we give out the literature appropriately, but that we try to ensure that we become more engaged in the democratic process. And that is something that we find quite astonishing when we've done um, voter registration. Our latest uh, questionnaire, we ask people if they're answer a few questions about what they know devolution has already brought to Scotland. And they will say yes, no, depending on what the question is. And then at the end of it, we say, do you think that an independent Scotland could possibly provide more or better? And we find that as a way to engage with people. But truthfully, from 2013 to the moment, I don't think we've once been asked in a public school or in a drop-in about nationalism and identity. Okay, so let me answer that. There's no yeah. question yeah. there. Yeah. It's just the okay. way yeah. that I've been trying well, to follow you. You see, I, let me try and see whether I can persuade you that identity is there in, 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 in what you were telling me. And let me start off, I mean, in a sense, 
you, what you were arguing was that you know people are interested in the things that are in their interests like cost of living okay and again when you look at a lot of psychology um, mm -hmm. there is you know, a very basic approach called rational actor theory which says we act in our self-interest okay and my response to that is to say when you say we act in our self-interest often that presupposes what the self and therefore what the interest is i mean and normally you know in economic theory it's saying well it's monetary interest if you make more money you'll, you'll be happy i would argue that the key term in self-interest right is what is myself and therefore what are the values the things that are important um to me and that as i was trying to argue but when I think of myself as an individual, my values, my priorities are very, I think of myself as a group member. Now, implicit in what you were saying, that the interests we have here are things like, I mean, cost of living for ordinary people. So, you know, it is around, you know, creating a society in which ordinary people are going to be uh, well off and better off. It's implying a more equal uh, society. It's implying all sorts of things which are premised upon, you know, here you have a group, you know, you know of women for independence, um, which is prioritizing a whole set of a whole sets of notions of what sort of society. So it's almost as if the identity is implicit in terms of the things which you and talk to people. You know, decent childcare um, will be important. You know, uh, uh, addressing violence and, 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 and so on. So in, in, in a sense, the thing is that we often think of identity as the end. We are doing it for an identity. People talk about identity politics. And I, I actually think the notion of identity politics this is the way in which identity is far more fundamental. It's not the end we're working for independence in order you know for our identity but our identity is the ground it's the basis on which we define who we are or what counts for us and what is being well off what is a better society so I, I i think identity is there but it's it's there in a different way it's not it, it's not irrelevant so i don't know whether that that helps at all <laughs> So yeah, I think we'll finish there and we'd just like to thank Stephen one more time. So just... Thank you. You were going to um to buy a drink but because you're traveling tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. And yeah, I want to thank everybody for coming. So, thank you. Thank you.